Welcome back inside the Part for May for podcast number 766. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. A.K.A. Negative Camber. You know why I've asked you here. You must convince the villagers that I'm harmless. That's exactly what I need you to do. Tonight, for your kind consideration, we're going to cover some F1 stuff, because that's what we do. Yes. Uh, covering F1 news or related stuff. Who knows? I'm excited to say that tonight I am not only joined by my co-host from the right coast, but I'm also joined by my co-host from the south coast, down in Dallas-Fort Worth, the amazing Paul Chores. I have Paul and Grace tonight. Paul, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, uh, ramping up for Daytona. Heading to Daytona this week for the Going to Daytona for the, the roar. For the roar. The roar, the Daytona 24 hours. Paul, yes. you're fielding two cars this year. Yes. Epic. That, by the way, that's offensive in England. Is it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just maybe two? You need to blur Should that out when way? you re-edit this. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There you go. So you have two cars <laughs> in the IMSA series. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so you got two of those. Uh, that is a massive program you're fielding this year for the Heart of Racing, Aston Martin team. The number yes. 23 car and the number... 27. 27 car. Mm -hmm. Right. And your team just did uh, what? The Abu Dhabi race? No, we did the Dubai 24-hour oh, race in, in the GT4 team, which is also a two-car team. And uh, <laughs> usually, but we only sent yeah. one car to Dubai and came second in the Dubai 24. So that is... Did you uh, come second? It came second. Second. <laughs> second. Um, good. So, uh, yeah. So that's, it's a good start to the year so far, right? It's crazy. Dubai's a long way away, by the way. Just <laughs> it sure is. It is. Yeah. I yeah. would imagine you were spending uh, a lot of time with logistics on that one. <laughs> there was a lot of ramping up of logistics to get there. Just And, and it barely got there, I'll, I'll tell you that. And not everything got there. Yeah. But, uh, well, yeah, your drivers got there and the car got there. Yeah, yeah, the car got there. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's on its way back. That's all we can yeah. fathom. Fingers crossed. Because the SRO season with the other team, that starts in February. So that's literally three weeks after Daytona. So it's, oh. it's, it's nuts right now. Insane. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Well, everyone's dying to know, how many tokens did you spend on car development in the winter? And how's the number 23 and 27 looking? Well, we've, we've spread them out evenly. <laughs> you know, 50,000 each. Yeah. So it, we've converted our GT3 cars to actually the Formula One cars from last year. Sweet. We're just hoping <laughs> no one notices. That's like a customer car scenario yeah, over there. Yeah, You're like pro one prerequisite was not to have Lance in the car. So. Ah, good call. <laughs> yeah. Good call. Luckily, wow. he doesn't listen to this podcast or his dad. No, I doubt either of them do. Tragically, you know, they may yeah. learn something occasionally. Right. Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Just occasionally insightful over here. The rest of the podcast, well, you know, it's... Uh, not good enough, damn it, not good not enough. Good enough. Grace, welcome to the podcast with Paul. You know, I was just thinking that for the off-season, this is a lot of Formula One that we have planned here, people, so you better enjoy it. I know, I know. For You're cutting off into my off-season time. I know. Normally, we'd no. be talking about wine and cheese. Right, right. We'd be sure, should be a, like page two of the, you know... Best Roquefort cheeses. Exactly. Ooh, I just had Roquefort for the first time in a long time the other night. It was I love blue cheese, of course, and Roquefort. Yes. I used to eat that when I was a little kid. I loved Roquefort. Were you spoiled? I was. We just had cheese sure. that was old that had blue on it. We, we had the right. Like, <laughs> we used to walk up. It was hill in a packet. To, to <laughs> and from school, so, yeah. We had to live in a shoe box in the middle of the road. <laughs> Cardboard box. You were lucky. <laughs> There's you eating your Roquefort. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Mummy, can I have some more wafer thin crackers, please? <laughs> and Paul's I over mean, there in Essex. Can I have some more, please? Like Oliver. <laughs> I actually grew up eating Velveeta, which isn't actually cheese at all, so it's fine. It's a uh, cheese like okay. substance. It's like, it it's sure like what was that SNL Doesn't it skit? say aged cheddar on the box, though? I'm Does it? Sure it's no, aged. it's not no. real cheese at all. I don't think, well, I think it's a cheese like product. I had a big argument with my wife for many months when she talked about the cheese at the sports stadium she went it's real i said that's not real cheese but has aged cheddar on the label like, <laughs> i'm sure that's not regulated by the fda right like it didn't no. give you a percentage though right or maybe they like you know how like songs if you're like 
four notes off or something, then you don't have to pay royalties. Maybe like cheddar was spelled right. slightly wrong or they right. used a slightly <laughs> different font or something, so it doesn't right. count. Right. What right. was that in coming to America? It's the golden arcs. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. 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 Close. right. right. Close. What's that uh, SNL skit that was almost pizza? It's like pizza, but don't call this pizza. It's almost pizza. <laughs> yes. I didn't see that one. Oh, you got to look it up. It's hilarious. Yeah. Ah, uh, boy. So it's very rare that we get all three of us here. It's uh, it's it. Well, it's a treat, Paul, uh, yeah, to have yeah. you. Well, you know, you only got a certain budget to use all year long. You got to spread yeah, it out. Yeah, that's right. So I've spent all of our tokens, the development <laughs> right tokens, right here, right now. This podcast. This is this it. Is it. This is all you all get. out there at the beginning. Yeah. The rest of the year, it's like the Haas F1 team podcast. Right. You know, it's just, yeah. you know, I'm just trying to get our drivers to get their sea legs here this year. So yeah, we got one front wing. We got to share it. Unlike That's Haas, right. we don't have a wealthy uh, Russian oligarch to to fund the podcast. <laughs> tragically, so yeah. this also looks good on front page of Pravda. <laughs> yeah, it's a threaten us with a shiv if our son doesn't get the good bits. That's right. Well, no, that's Adrian Sutil. <laughs> And a bar fight with a shit or bottle. a broken right. champagne flute. Whatever's right. handy, you know? Yeah, He's yeah. Like, oh, where was Drives to Survive then, huh? Oh, could you peach. imagine Drives to sure. Survive in the nightclub? Remember? Or, Remember you know, Adrian's? Early... Go ahead. The no. early years of Kimmy. Right. Do yeah, you remember Do dolphin. you remember that, though? Yeah. When that all happened, it was at a nightclub. Now, for you Lewis Hamilton fans that are new to the sport, you got to go back and look at the Google Adrian Sutil, Lewis Hamilton nightclub, uh, 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 champagne flute stabbed because yeah. they were that like happened. that before the nightclub. They were. And then they went like that. You yeah. remember that, Paul? After mm -hmm. that, Lewis pretty much threw Adrian under the bus yeah. on that yeah. deal. Yeah, he ran away. And yeah. he he was like, Whoop. he uh, yeah, he was like, run away. He got away <laughs> from that situation. Yeah. And Adrian was pissed at Lewis. Yeah. I, I'd be surprised if they even talked since then. So that yeah. was quite a scandal. Right. Sure no was. Christmas cards there. No, no, no Harry and F David fruit basket from no. Lewis on that. Yeah. Oh boy. All right. Well, hey, speaking, if you're new to Formula One, which many of you may be uh, because you watch Drive to Survive and you thought, this is an incredible action packed racing series I can get behind. The passing is prolific, the competition is mesmerizing. Boy, have you been duped. Um, but, but I thought, okay, I was being, I was being <laughs> cheeky there. I agree. Uh, but I thought, what might be good for you veterans out there, you've already plowed through the technical regulations, you've already got them mapped out like one of those British TV crime dramas mm. where, you know, you're trying to figure out who the hell got killed on the towpath, you know. Yeah. Lots of pins and all the pins strength. and the lines, <laughs> and you've got it all mapped out. And, well, no, wait a minute, by my estimation, DRS, you know, you, you guys got all this sus. But for those newer to Formula One, we're going to go through the 2022 regulation changes. We're going to talk about them and maybe occasionally be insightful. And then we're going to get Paul's expert real racing person take on this because Paul has to deal with PSI and aerodynamics and, you know, aero loads and that kind of stuff, right? Bull bearings. Yeah. It's gauze pads and ball bearings and four and one oil today. Uh, so anyway, we're going to talk about that. So let's start off. I'm going to talk about wheels because we just did a test after the last race uh, on the new wheel. So after years of using a 13 inch wheel, F1's going to move to a new 18 inch wheel with not just a larger wheel, but a low profile tire from Pirelli besides looking better now why is this important because every single race paul's throwing those on his aston martin he's dealing with low profile tires he oh. understands how those tires work besides looking better, relevance yes well you use michelin you don't use mm -hmm. pirelli's and you you weren't afraid to admit to me that you like the folks at michelin and think yeah. they make a nice tire um, but besides looking better the goal was to make these tires less temperature sensitive when sliding around and allow them to be pushed harder while also retaining the performance drop off that we currently have for that strategic element. So what do I mean by that? Well, that 
right now we have the high degradation tires and those high, those degradation they have higher degradation rate so the tires wear out or have a performance where it wears out and kind of gets to a cliff where it loses grip over the course of a stent but paul we're talking about um it's not uh, they're going to use a standard tire pressure that we've uh, you know the tire pressure monitor that they monitor tire pressures but the tires are going to also be benefit from a reduced sidewall deflection changes during the car's performance and and this may make it easier for them to design the car around that reduced sidewall uh and maybe even a little more affordable um and because they they don't have to account for all the side load or the sidewall loads that they used to have and deflection. So, Paul, we've talked about this in the past and we've talked about that 13 inch tire and you know more about it than I do. But you've talked about the thickness of that sidewall mm. is a big, big factor in the car design in Formula One and the deflection of that f sidewall, meaning how much it leans over, how much when you're putting a load on a sidewall, how much that car drops or lifts. That's all playing into the aerodynamic design of a chassis and baked in to the chassis design itself based on how that sidewall deflection. But like your Aston Martin cars with that lower sidewall, that sidewall deflection is reduced. And this is critical uh, for a car design, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, if the car designers could not use tires, they would much prefer it because the tire is, is an organic thing rather than the mechanical, you know, numbers you know and ones and o's i mean it it moves around like the 13 inch tire was like a massive moving object um and you've seen some of those slow mos where the tire is just vibrating left to right and you can mm -hmm. just imagine what that feels like in the car how how you can get something that's moving around so much to actually give you a firm consistent platform on the car is nearly impossible um so anything you can do to reduce movement in the car at all um you can better engineer and dial the car in to be more consistent but um obviously with that volume of tire that volume that sidewall flex you know the the tire pressures would would grow and fall massively because mm -hmm. it's just such a, a big a big uh capacity right um and it, and, and even in the, in the, even the uh, smaller sidewall tires you still get some flex but usually after two laps you're pretty much got your pressures up unless you start abusing the tire so as long as you you, you need to stay off the curb so in those first two laps um, but after that you pretty much got a tire you can ride pretty hard and the consistency stays there for a lot longer um, the the hd portion of the pirelli tire is kind of it's designed in to probably um go bad more than Pirelli could actually, if they started from scratch, said, hey, build us a really sturdy tire that can really stay, it would be a harder tire for sure. Um, but they can't design a, a tire that lasts longer and is more consistent, but that wasn't what they were asked to do. Um, they got a little silly with it a few years ago, came mm. back from that. Um, and we we're kind of back to that um, 13 inch tire uh, deal that the Formula One has been in since its inception pretty yeah. much, right? Um, and it isn't an archaic tire size, you know, I mean, not even a mini has a 13 inch wheel anymore. <laughs> right. Um, but the whole design philosophy from formula one has been that, that case. And so they design, they've designed the suspension, the aerodynamics, everything to work with a tire that work, that moves around and, and behaves in that manner. And now they're going to have to start all over again, but saying that they're professional, they're the top. Formula One teams, one of the top, obviously the top teams in, in the world. Um, it's not like any, everyone's like, I've never even seen an 18 inch tire. They're going to bring in people with a lot of experience from, with those tires um, mm -hmm. to show them and help design the cars in a way that can maximize it. Now, I, met, I read um, the Adrian Newey book, which is really good when he goes car by car and how he's mm -hmm. the design philosophy. At the end there, he was saying, well, the, the 18 inch tires are just not going to be as quick as, as the, um, 13 inch uh, because of the way they perform and how how the air, air works around them but i think they're going to actually probably get their heads around that very quickly as we've seen over the many years no matter what they do they make the tires narrow they put treads on the tire you know formula one finds a way of finding that performance back yeah and paul would it be safe to say so in like the imsa series with your with your number 23 aston martin 
Uh, yep. Once you get a couple laps, you get that that heat cycle in that tire. Um, then that tire sidewall deflection, how it performs in the corners and stuff, becomes at that point relatively predictable over the the cycle or the stint. Even if you double stint them, they're relatively predictable in Formula One terms. The degradation is where you lose that predictability uh, that that you guys may enjoy, where you don't have that high degradation. Then, once that sidewall is kind of seated in, the heat cycles in that tire. Then you've got what you've got, basically. Right. Whereas in Formula One, um, that that it, it gets bedded in heat cycle, but then you start having that degradation and that grip starts falling off at Sticks a, at a less yeah. predictable. And, and what you're always trying to do, trying to match. The pressure being at the ultimate pressure that you want that tire to work at mm -hmm. with the temperature at the same time that's yeah. what you're always going for especially in qualifying you're trying to get when you because you have to go at a lower pressure because the tire is always going to build up pressure so you're trying to make it so that once the tire has got the energy in it temperature wise that that pressure is also at its best part and you're trying mm -hmm. to make make them meet exactly the same point and that's when when they say the tires are you know switched on that everything's working right. exactly how they want it. If you get one of those wrong, then things aren't going to work, work out so mm -hmm. well. And as I said, you know, when they're running behind a pace car and they lose temperature mm -hmm. in the tire, then the graphs are going off the charts on trying to how to get that that tire back in the window. Right. And that's one thing that, that I was looking at, Grace, when I was reading these from a fan's perspective anyway. I was thinking, you know, you and I've talked about this, Paul and I've talked about this, and I've never been a great fan of the high drug addition tire. I've, I'm not a big fan of it. And I would prefer they've just made a really good tire and let them go racing. But I was intrigued about this regulation set because one thing that was a bit annoying, and we, you and I've talked about this, Grace, in different podcasts, was that um, it's this whole concept around the heat cycle or heat window for these tires, right? And these tires in the past were so sensitive to the heat windows, and it was just kind of maddening because you'd say, well, you know, why is McLaren struggling or Ferrari struggling or whatever it might be? And it was like, they just can't get that the tire into the heat window. They can't, you know, Haas struggled with this. You just can't get this tire in the heat window and the way the chassis is interacting with the tire. And there was all these random things. And it was always so frustrating to me because it was like, damn it, you know, why should these teams be hunting around and toiling at the back of their grid? Because they just can't get the heat window in the tire because the heat windows are so narrow. And what I was excited about is the possibility that these tires will be less sensitive to that heat element and, and you know, getting too much heat into the tires. And I don't know. I'm just hoping that this is going to improve, that they won't have to worry about that so much as they are just looking at, a degradation rate and how they build their strategy around it. Right. So I think the thing is, is that, and I'm sure this is going to come up as we go through each of these points is that what I think the three of us as opposed as, as well as many other listeners are against is making the racing interesting artificially, hmm. like, which is what having the high degradation tires do, right? Yes. Everybody has the same situation, but it, it, it you know, it's it's trying too hard, I guess. Um, and as the kids would say, it's trying too hard, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think this is an improvement. I also, as I was listening to you and Paul talk about it, I think, you know, many of the other, like the race or anybody else at Chain Bear or anybody else's podcast you watch when they talk about the tires, I think this is one where a visual was really helpful. I think that, I mean, like we all drive cars, you kind of have a sense of what uh, tires feel like, but maybe you've never... You know, we don't all switch tires on our cars either, right? Like most people probably just whatever tires are on there. And then if they need them, they look them up on like tire rack and have somebody put them on and they never really think about the tires. Put the cheap again. ones on. Yeah. yeah, right. Or whatever. So I just think that, you know, because they had the visual that kind of showed you how the, t you know, I'm trying to use my hand like that's useful because it doesn't, but it just showed you how the different uh, tire walls would change in that heat window. Mm -hmm. And so I think of all of these, Although uh, when we get to ground effects, like the arrows of where the air goes is also kind of helpful. But I think we've seen enough of how that looks visually to understand that. I think the tires, though, if you just listen to this and like, what? Find somebody that has a visual like race or somebody that has, you know, a graphics budget and isn't just spending all their tokens on this one podcast. I have all three of us here together <laughs> right. um, that can show you. And I think that makes a lot more sense about why um, this is uh, how that actually works on a tire. 
Right, right. And Paul, do you think from a driver perspective, do you think this 18 inch uh, wheel and, and low profile tire, is this going to be a radical change for these drivers? Or do you think, you know, once they get on the brakes and contact patches are pretty much still wide? And yeah, I mean, think- I mean, they'll always be there to maximize whatever's there and the good drivers get to that point pretty quick, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, but, but we knew from you know when the hd stuff came around some drivers were very adept at making the best of that situation some mm-hmm. not not that one was a lot better driver than them but they their style just happened to suit that tire and made them look like a hero versus someone that maybe struggled a lot but was just as talented a driver that's the mm-hmm. frustrating thing when they start playing around with those things and then cars um every car is going to adapt differently to how that tire works as well. So mm-hmm. um, it depends what that match what that driver is going to get into their engineering depth to help the driver find the way to get that tire to work. As I said, at that point that they need to bring the tire up to the pressure and the, and the temperature and make them last over a certain amount of time. Um, some drivers are going to be better than others. If, if you look at Charles Leclerc, when he first came into Formula mm-hmm. one, he struggled really he looked right. like a, a bit of a, you know, it's like, had this guy get an F1 drive the first right. few races, then, you know, he did a lot of homework and figured out how to get that tire to work for him. And that's what all the drivers have to do. I can't, I can't tell you, you know, some with a lot of experience over the years, people like Lewis, you know, mm-hmm. um, who have seen many different rule changes and had to adapt to them. They'll probably find a way of getting to that point quicker than maybe someone that's been kind of st- new and to kind of stuck in the first rendition of a Pirelli type tire and how it works. Right. It'll be interesting to see um, if they're less sensitive to heat, they still have degradation, that low profile, the car will be designed around that tire um, and intended to use that tire. And, And really the gamble here, Paul, is that chassis design with the new aerodynamic design and how much heat these different teams can generate in those tires uh, right. to get them as grippy as possible without wearing them out. So there's a real huge, huge element in the chassis design around this tire and not much known about that tire. So I think this is going to be a real um, something that the teams are going to really hit the ground on the first race and think, oh my gosh, we're generating way too much heat or we're not generating nearly enough. And how do we get there with the limited arrow uh, that we have? So. Yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, the next element wait, is wait. yeah. This was I thought this was the international sign for Grace has something she'd like to share. <laughs> yes, no, but this, this is a U.S. podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> an international. Right. Anyway, I was just gonna say I was just looking, and I don't I don't think this is in the notes, but aren't they? Didn't they also change the tire warmer blanket thingies? Like doesn't yeah. everything? Have- they lower. Yeah, they it yeah. can't be pumped. Yeah, it can't be jazzed up to a high as high a temperature. They're gradually eking the tire warmers um, temperature as the yeah. years go on till eventually they're trying to get to a point where you're going to go out without tire warmers on. It's just a piece of, you know, material that you're throwing over your tires for a little, <laughs> yeah, little, right. little cuddly blanket. Yeah, yeah, right. It makes the tire feel strategy. better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Are they on yellows or whites? Safe. We don't know. Let's just cover them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I remember that was a thing too, right? That they were they were, yeah. yeah, You're right. Yeah. They're just slowly going to get rid of them. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's going to be harder. I mean, a, a car that generates a lot of downforce is going to be able to get a cold tire up to temperature high, quicker. Yeah. You know, but now we're going to see how the downforce levels affect the ability to get a tire up to temperature. It's going to be an interesting um, yeah. turn of events. It will. Next up is suspension. Uh, they've got a simplified design that dictates the suspension in and it says that it must directly attach to the wheel hub unlike some of the trick suspension designs from merck and uh at the time toro rosso uh, they're doing away with that so it's got to directly uh connect to the wheel hub uh, the suspension will not feature any of the cool tech from the past like uh hydraulic ride height adjustments inerters or anything like that it's a very simplified suspension it's just dampers or shocks and springs and and that's basically it um so you've kind of dictated um uh, a very straightforward suspension uh instead of some of the trick suspensions that we've seen here in the past um also one of our favorite topics which is the listed parts 
uh, list, uh, which this is allowed, where the magic happens. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is what allowed Haas to come in and basically buy all their stuff off the shelf, That's save true. versus a couple things, right? Yeah, it worked out great for them. Sure yeah. has. Last year was a oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> they just they just did like a supermarket sweep through right auto zone with whatever they could get. Yeah. yeah. It's like supply it's chain like, went down for them last year. It was like one of those what was that cooking show where they had the shopping carts, they have like two minutes to go get all their gear, you know. Is that supermarket sweep? No, that's Maybe. something else. I don't know. You mean Guy Fieri's grocery yes. games? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And go. Go. Yeah, <laughs> they had Gunther in there. See, uh, engine, uh, chassis. I'd love to see Gunther taking a drive around Flavor Town. That would be great. <laughs> it would. Uh, let's see. So, list of parts. There is still a list of parts that must be made by the team, but there is allowance for standard parts from suppliers, such as fuel pump, tire pressure, those kind of things, that are allowed to all the teams. There is an allowance for parts to be supplied from one team to another team, such as a gearbox or hydraulic system, something like that. Um, and there are parts that a team can build, but those must adhere to a very strict specification. And then finally, there are a few parts that the teams are free to design themselves. And uh, so you can see there's listed parts, which, and then there's uh, third-party supplier parts that are standard. And then there are some team-to-team -team parts that, whereas in the past, like Williams would buy the gearbox, as well as the engine from Mercedes. Williams always wanted to make their own gearbox. Then last year they bought Mercedes gearbox uh, along with the engine supply. So there's that. And then there's a limited amount of parts that the teams are free just to design and build on their own. But all of those parts have to be documented, drawn out, and supplied to the FI so the FI knows what all those are. So there still is that listed parts element to this um, that allows for those smaller teams to be customers of engines, customers of gearbox, those kind of things. Um, and then there are standardized parts that all the teams buy from the fuel pumps, the uh, tire pressure monitors and those kind of things like that. So, um, so anyway, not that exciting of an element, but I did want to bring that up. Yeah. But, but it, I mean, that's a strategy game though. Mm -hmm. It is. That system, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, especially now you've got salary cap in there or not salary right. cap, but, a, a, a well, however that's going to work, which it's not, um, <laughs> But it, uh, you know, we're, we're halfway to customer cars, and I'm okay with that. You know, with that process. Mm -hmm. You know, so because some teams trying to climb up the ladder, you know, it's mm -hmm. way more efficient with a personnel count and a cost count per item to be able to right. buy something that doesn't really pertain to the performance of the car, but just has to be designed no matter what. Right? right. You have to have one of these widgets. Right. Um, do you want to have to build a custom one that's going to cost you 10 times the amount or can you just buy it off the shelf or, yeah. or go down to Ferrari and buy it out of their pasta pump? Right. Well, if every, Grace, if everybody's got to have a flux capacitor, then why not just make a standardized one that everybody can buy and it's cheaper? That's right. Doc Brown will get right on that for you. <laughs> Marty! Yeah. Just don't tell the Libyans, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Doc. Uh, so anyway, so there's your listed parts. But yeah, so I do think, I, I, I don't know, to piggyback on what Paul was saying, I think that this is a place that feels like blah, 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 boring, but is a place to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And as we go through the season, it's a place to pay attention to, even though it's not really that exciting as a list. No, I thing. agree, Grace. I think it's, um, you know, who's buying what parts and from whom. Yeah, and, and just like always. It, yeah. It's a it's important element because all these little parts that you have eventually make a Formula One car. Um, so let's talk about the engine. Uh, the 1.6 liter turbo hybrid will remain the same, but here's the challenge here. They will be homologated at the start of the season and then completely frozen in development until 2025. Now, this could be very interesting in my mind if someone like, say, oh, I don't know, Mercedes, uh, come up with a big advancement to their hybrid engine and they start the season with some serious advancement in their engine 
and then everything's frozen, that could mean another three years of baked in advantage, like I've been saying they've been enjoying since 2014, and everybody's beating me up. And now since 2014, nobody will say, gee, Todd, sorry about that. Sorry we beat you up. You're right. They did have a baked in advantage. I'm not bitter or anything, Paul. Is but, that when you bring in reliability upgrades? Right, those reliability yes. upgrades, yes. yes. So anyway, now here's the thing, though. So it is important because they're going to be homologated and frozen in development. Up until this point, they've been able to make reliability upgrades and a few advancements uh, in development of this engine. So there's a couple things at play here. You've got Honda, who left the series, uh, this year, they're going to be supplying um, engines for Red Bull, but ultimately next year, not in 22, 23, Red Bull is on their own. They're going to have their own engine, um, and everything's going to be homologated. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays or if it has any issue. Uh, so if, you know, Grace being a McLaren fan, you're hoping that Mercedes does come with a big advance in their engine performance this year to get them locked in until 2025. That's an interesting thing. So if, if see, as Honda are supplying the engine and it's homologated frozen right now, what the Red Bull really have to do? Well, that was really part the next of- the three years. That was really part of Red Bull. So when Honda said they were going to leave Red Bull this past year, you I don't know if, if you guys remember, but Red Bull was seriously lobbying the FIA and making sure that their engine strategy going forward was going to be protected. And because they were being forced into a role of being their own engine manufacturer and starting up their own engine department, one critical element of that was getting these engines frozen so they don't have to develop it until 2025. That means that from this year forward, they're maintaining the Honda engine they have and, and continuing to maintain a homologated engine, allowing them to ramp up their own engine department to come out with their own lump in 2025. And that was a critical element for Red Bull, Paul. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's crucial now. So hopefully for them, they just can be an engine production company mm -hmm. rather than engine design company and obviously that gives them three years to try and find a new partner or to retalk honda back in the game again <laughs> yeah. right right start sending right. them fruit baskets now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. dear honda <laughs> get your ass back in f1 love christian hey Believe somebody that... get yuki down here to translate for us <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, keep stop stop the blue talk, Yuki. Yeah, keep it right. clean. Keep it we'll clean. give you Yuki back in trade for an engine supply. Right. <laughs> we'll let yeah. him out of the trunk of our Red Bull. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So it is an important element. So you look at Red Bull, keep an eye on their engines, keep an eye on, I read a headline uh, today that said that possibly Cyril Bite Bull could be joining Red Bull to lead their engine development. Wow, department. good Who luck. Who doesn't want that to happen? Him and Christian <laughs> together again. I know, I know. After the whole season one, a drive to survive and, and the, the conflict that those two had, I, I'd love to be in a planning meeting with christian and cyril talking about red bull's new engine that would be hilarious yeah yeah oh, the, the one one company i'm worried about is renault mm. or alpine whatever you want yeah, to call it yeah, they yeah. seem to be the ones that never shone any time with their engine we've seen ferrari obviously they made illegal gains but they lost <laughs> them and they came back a little bit right the honda engine i think even though it's different than mercedes is you know not necessarily on the same day can can beat a Mercedes engine, right. um, but but Renault I think are the ones that probably needed to do more work than anybody over the yeah. off season to try and get their frozen engine to be as good as it could be. I agree, Paul. I think they've got to come out with a big development upgrade this year if they have the tokens if they've got the room to spend it on because it's going to be frozen and Alpine's going to be in a world of hurt yeah. uh, if they don't for until twenty twenty five. Um, which is another thing that I bring up, Grace, is, is, is the engine development thing on this with the whole token system you and I talked in the past. It's frustrating because if you feel the team, and this is why I didn't like the hybrid engine because they're so galactically expensive that nobody could afford the damn things and they bankrupted 
two teams at least and had three others on life support. And it was frustrating because, you know, a team like Alpine, like Paul said, a team like Alpine that came in, they can't, you know, if your engine's not developing their power, you know, they need to be able to develop that, you know, they've got to be able to catch up. But when you're frozen like this, I don't know, it's tough. It is tough because I think your only option is to then try to convince the other people that we don't really, we didn't really want this, right? Because <laughs> right. I think that that happens, right? The teams are like, oh, we're just kidding. I know we agreed to freezing this at 2025, but, you right. know, me and my like six other friends here, we think that maybe that wasn't such a great idea. So let's unfreeze them. So I think that's the only other option you would have is to try to, or try to convince them like, oh, you know, this, this little, this little thing here, this doesn't, this doesn't count. Yeah. Maybe that's why they brought up Maron because he was so successful of them changing the rules for the uh, Aston Martin team. Now you're now <laughs> with you're... the high rake, low rake. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Come on, guys. <laughs> that's yeah, what's I'm... on his resume, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First bullet He's... point. Yeah. Good at arguing with the FIA to get our way. Hire Crazy. him. Game changer. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of intrigued by the whole Otmar thing. I'll get into that later, but mm. me too. I... Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll right. reserve my comments for later. Uh, fuel. At least 10% of the fuel must comprise of, quote, advanced sustainable ethanol, or in common parlance, we call that E10. Uh, which fuel manufacturers, now Paul and I happen to know this. <laughs> I can't tell you why we know this, but we know this. Uh, fuel manufacturers don't really like uh, ethanol and making E10, and they don't really like it at all. Um, and it's very difficult to make a racing fuel that has what they would consider this ethanol, which is, you know, a foreign substance in among what they're used to making as right. high octane racing fuel. And so they have to figure out a way to do this. So point being here is... Keep your eye on that because Total or BP or Petrobras or or, or Petronas or or um, uh, uh, no, there's Petrobras. Sorry, um, and uh, Shell all have a tremendous amount of work to do here to come up with a really good high output racing fuel. And Grace has her finger up. Go, Grace. I have a question. All right, so here's the thing. So in your road car. What, you know, people will say, who should I get my gas? Should I go to, you know, BP? Should I go to Exxon? What, what gas should I put in my car? Who makes the best gas? The answer is whoever has sure. the least amount of, of <laughs> ethanol in your gas, right? You can't and, still buy fuel without ethanol in it. Yeah. I understand Even that. Even Bucky's I'm, has it. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that usually cheaper gas has more ethanol in it. And so what happens is you don't get so much, you don't get as much performance. So if you go to Shell and you buy their V powered, which costs you three times as much, you'll go longer on that fuel because it has less ethanol in it, right? So to me, this is like, you know, the, that cost trade-off. Like I'd rather spend $100 on a suitcase and buy it once than to spend $25 at Target and have to keep buying it every year because the suitcase is crap and keeps falling apart or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So what is that trade-off? So I get that the ethanol in the fuel is a more sustainable fuel, but isn't it going to burn faster? So doesn't that defeat the purpose of being an ep economical advantage or being a sustainable I, I, I don't energy. think economics even come into it. It's just perception of what mm. they're perceiving. Well, that's you fine. Know, that's I, it. I yeah, just the, want people to be transparent about that then because that's totally what happens with road cars is that you, your gas was cheaper because it had more ethanol in it, but my car on the Shell V power will go much longer than yeah, yours will. Exactly. And, and it will help your engine last longer. Correct. It will give you yeah. more fuel efficiency. It, there's really no gain to it other right. than what people people's perception of what it is doing and what it's made of versus right. what the full full monty is right. made of but but you know at least it's not electric Oi! you know yeah and you know it's, it's it's not even that it's actually a lot of the internal parts on the cars are also gonna have a lifespan less mm -hmm. fuel cells fuel lines all this stuff with because you're basically putting 10% of crap in, in right. the fuel and you would have to deal with it, you know? It's like and, jaggy crap, right? Yeah. It's just like yeah, it's through just your whole line, right? The content, just, uh, there's just all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff that comes with it that 
as right. I said, the perception is not the reality with with ethanol. So yeah, it changes yeah. the burn rate, everything. Right, know? right. Yeah. So so uh, so, so that seems are going to have to be on top of that reliability wise. Uh, they'll have to change parts and fuel cells and things mm -hmm. more often, and they have to try and make that fuel work. Well, so then why and, don't and why this is why. I was just going to say, Grace, this is why I was bringing this up, because not only is it a daunting task for the fuel manufacturers, but I'm kind of wondering about the whole three engines for a whole season, given the reliability issues. You're you're running a different fuel through these engines, you know, uh, a markedly different fuel and different temperatures and those kind of things. And so I'm kind of curious on how that may play. It may not impact it at all, but it wouldn't surprise me if it did. Go ahead, Grace. I was just going to say, I don't know why why would they just not if it's only because of optics right which is what paul's point is and i agree with that right this is only optics it looks good to people that they're doing this it seems like the responsible thing to do but i think if i can clumsily explain why this isn't the right thing to do in like two sentences which somebody who actually knows what they're talking about could explain it in one sentence why wouldn't you do that you know i think i think working in surveys people often are critical of us using incentives to increase our response rate to get more people to answer your survey but if I pay 10 people $2 and you all answer with the first time I knock on your door, that's cost savings, even though it doesn't seem like it because I'm paying people extra money, right? Mm -hmm. This is kind mm -hmm. of that same thing. Like maybe it doesn't seem like that, but the science behind it says, well, you know, back up that this is actually maybe not a good idea. You're actually going to do worse for the environment, if you will, than yeah. by running E10. Well, and, it, and to your point, Grace, if you're going to use a lot more of it. Right then you know what what are we accomplishing many years ago 2013 ish um uh, i was doing a podcast uh, and we had steve matchett on the show and and so steve and i had talked about this and and i agree very much with steve and i don't know if he's changed his mind maybe this has been years ago but uh but i still kind of absolutely agree with him uh on this and we both agreed at the time that when we were talking about moving this hybrid engine, it didn't make a lot of sense because the astronomical cost of development of this hybrid technology, and we understood the optics of it all. But when we talked about it, I thought it was a much better idea, and, and he agreed at the time, um, that if you would just use less of something would be a huge advantage um over creating all these batteries and you know all this stuff and the resources it takes and time and materials and everything that it took to make that and his point was if you just simply starve a v8 engine on a fuel flow rate you will see engineering you've never seen before figure out how to take a starved reduced fuel rate and still deliver a thousand horsepower the kind of technology and design that would come out of an of internal combustion engine design to take less fuel and and continue to deliver the same kind of performance output would be astronomical it'd be an instant knock on to road car efficiency and we'd be using much less petrol in order to deliver the same kind of performance and entertainment value and i, and I still kind of agree with that very much in that vein because i think there's a lot to be gained from that you know instantaneously um but anyway um Keep your eye on the fuel. The fuel, the manufacturers of the fuel have a huge task. How will that fuel, will it have any impact at all on the engines? What will the performance characteristics be? Um, how much horsepower loss from the ice will they have? Keep your eye on that fuel because it, it is a, a key element to this. Because um, people didn't think tires were a sexy topic to talk about. Now we're talking fuel, about fuel yeah. too, right? <laughs> right, Oof, right super sexy. Right, <laughs> right. And will it have different performance and different mileage characteristics that are going to be back to lift and coast what kind of knock-on right. effects might we have from this right keep your eye on it. all right now we get into uh, ground effects <clears throat> so ground effects currently the floor of an f1 car is effectively flat with a few exceptions but it's effectively flat but the new design will have two tunnels creating a venturi effect under the car and compressing the air as it exits the back of the car to create a large low pressure area which means that a serious amount of suction is going to be sucking that car down to the ground and this is used to make a cleaner wake of disturbed air from behind the car 
And now the outlet of the air is also much higher out of the back of the car, meaning that the disturbed air would be higher than a trailing car. So if you've got the lead car and a trailing car, if the disturbed air is coming out right in front of the car, then that's that's difficult. But if the disturbed air is coming out above the trailing car, then that's better. And that's the intent. Well, many say, hey, it's awesome because this is a return to the ground effect era of the 1970s. It's not really uh, quite the same thing as what Paul and I enjoyed watching in the 1970s. Uh, namely, there, you know, there's no side skirts, which were key to the aero back in the 70s, Paul. And the current cars do generate downforce through, un through the underside of the car, but it's done with, with the barge boards, directing air back underneath the car. Um, and so this allows for better air management uh, and less a disrupted air or the wake that that car leaves uh, as it goes through the air. So to that point, Paul, it's not the same as the 70s when, when you know, you and I watched the ground effects cars of the 70s with the skirts down the side and no front wing because they didn't need it. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> arrows car, I think, back then. Uh, not quite the same, but this should be intriguing nonetheless. Yeah, it, it definitely should be. And it's, it's, it's how it generates the, the downforce, obviously, under the car percentage-wise over, over the top of the car, which disturbs everything. And also the car behind... If it was relying on all the bodywork over the top of the car, then the disturb air has a bigger percentage of, of function to disturb, you know, how much downforce that car is. But because all the air, uh, a larger percentage is underneath the car, it's also a lot less susceptible to the car in front's wake, disturbing its efficiency and make the ground effects work as well. So in theory, it's 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 a pretty clean and clear way to do it. Yes, uh, the barge boards wings that they've just tried to find ways of managing the air to make it as efficient as possible. The ground effect was obviously the most efficient way of doing that. Um, and it's just because of the rule change that the teams had to try and find other ways to make it. Now they've obviously gone back to the ground effect. When, when did uh, the full ground effect go away? Like 82? 82. Yeah. Yeah. 82. And it was a late, late change as well, as far as I remember Yeah, for the teams to adapt to that. So, you know, most people in Formula One right now have never dealt with a car that, used as much ground effect under the car but uh, uh they're obviously very smart people and they're going to make the most of it so yes this is probably the most significant change i believe in in the car design yeah. rules uh, certainly aerodynamically anyway yeah so grace if you were hoping for the halcyon days of the 70s with jacques lafitte and ground effects that's not this right no right but the because the problem with those skirts, right, is that if you break the skirt, then you are in a lot of trouble, mm. right? You so are, this yes. is trying to make the skirt mm. a part of the vehicle as opposed to on the outside of the vehicle, right? So it makes it safer. So that's what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to create the the joy of racing that we got with ground effects with some safety, right? And um, Right. But you remember Nikki Lauda had car. said uh, when they talked about it initially going back to ground effects and he thought, uh, that's too dangerous because yeah. he, he lived through that grace. That right. was, you know, and he knew if, if you, if those skirts were working, it was awesome. But boy, if you lost a connection to that, you were toast. Right. And you didn't, and as a driver, I've spoken to a few couple of friends of mine that drove from the one cars back then, and, you know, there was no telltale. There was no warning that the skirt mm -hmm. got jammed under the last curb. You, you were, you know, Literally, it was like a 30 mile di now difference of how you could take a turn with the full skirts or without a skirt. And so if you turned into a corner with a skirt jammed up, you just simply just crashed. There was nothing, yeah. nothing you could do with it. So, yes, it's a lot more safe to do it this way without the sliding skirts to that jam. And even back then in the 70s, it was intriguing because the amount of downforce the Formula One cars generated wasn't equal to the design of the cars back then. They right. they had to, you know, it was like a massive leap in grip, but the cars weren't really ready for it, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, the cars are flexing, the cars are doing this okay. and that. And and they weren't ready to be able to be capable of that. They, 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 we're not going to have those issues um, now, but actually I, I just talking him back to when, because you went and said arrows and the A2 arrows, which is the one yeah. without the front wing, big bulbous thing with yeah. a, a big, and the only reason that car didn't work was because the chassis flexed and couldn't actually handle the downforce that car was creating. Right. And those back then it was a bit more black art and they didn't realize everything that was going on. Um, but now obviously 
uh, there's a lot, a lot more yeah. data that they're drawing from the cars. So uh, as I said, it probably we're probably not going to see many radical different interpretations of the rules like we did back then when the new cars come out. But I am excited to see how these teams have got around and read the rules and how they're going to maximize that ground effect and how the design of the car is going to reflect that. Yeah, it's not like the new cars won't have any aerodynamic downforce. They will. It still will have aerodynamic downforce, but you'll also have this uh, ground effects uh, in play too. So the reduction of aerodynamic downforce from the top of the car, meaning that the air pushes the car into the tarmac versus the car being sucked to the car tarmac like a reverse uh, uh, airplane wing in reverse, right? Um, and so that's effectively um, in very generic terms, mind you, um, kind of how the difference is. And this car is a combination of both. You've got aerodynamic downforce pushing it, and you've got some suction underneath pulling it. And the whole idea was is to eliminate the big uh, wake of disturbed air that's coming off the back of these cars so other cars can follow closer without losing uh, significant percentages of their downforce. And that's where we have been for years now. And they're trying to get away from that. The uh, Mortises. The oh, <laughs> yes. I even use that word here later. Um, uh, so then there's a brand new front wing. Uh, we've mentioned this in the past. Paul and I have talked about this several times on past podcasts of creating if they wanted to solve this. And Paul and I were, you know, uh, frustrated as, as, as anyone would be with the, you know, the aerodynamic downforce. These cars are generating well over twice their total weight in downforce. And so Paul and I talked about it and everybody's, oh, you know, gnashing teeth and wringing hands up. Oh, how are we going to fix it? Oh, my gosh. And I said, they're, they're not interested in fixing it because the black art is aerodynamic downforce. And Paul brought up this point. Paul, you said, look, you could solve this like that. And you could do it by coming up with no one likes a spec series or car, but all you'd have to have is a spec rear wing or front wing. I think you said front wing. Make a spec front wing, reduce the amount of downforce by 80% of that front wing. You can't just go dial on the same kind of downforce you do in the back because the car will be completely unbalanced. It'll solve that in a heartbeat and eliminate it. Well, that's kind of what they're doing here with this new front wing, Paul. It features only four elements that attach directly to the nose, and it has a single uh, piece end plate, not all that multiple you know, bits and bobbles uh, end plates, a single uh, piece end plate this should make them less sensitive to the air wash from the cars in front of them and it reduces that downforce a little bit yeah yeah it is effectively they're, they're coming up with this this way they've specced out some of these aerodynamic parts is definitely more spec rear wing spare front spec from wing kind of process and as it, it's, it's it's all to do with they're generating the percentage the front wing they have to they are able to allow the front wings to generate in the total performance of the car mm -hmm. is is twofold right it's it's not going to be dis as disturbed by the the wake in front because it's not as big a portion of the downforce that they're relying on that's why those cars are so set in their ways when they they everything had to be perfect for that front wing to generate was downforce were you nothing's perfect on a racetrack there's other cars out there there's other elements out there so it never works to its maximum efficiency so they're taking that as a much smaller percentage of the total downforce so therefore it's not as important whether it's in a wake or not in a wake right and grace you know maybe one of the upsides of this is we won't have all that carbon fiber laying all over the track like spa 98 every damn race because everybody's knocking their front wing pieces and everybody's talking about oh lewis has damage on his front end plate and it didn't do a damn thing to his performance right. he was still quick all those sticky yuppie bits will be gone yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah no yeah. sticky yuppie bits yeah do you remember the one year they they came up with this brilliant idea of letting the uh in indycar the different manufacturers come up with their own aero kit yes oh my god oh. Was, okay that wings thirty thousand dollars and marco yeah. android just knocked it off in turn one yeah well done and now there's a the shards the shards yeah. people yeah the humanity of the thing yeah. I know. The, pump shots. the shots yeah. it's dangerous it's dangerous get away from it now they're also coming out with a new rear wing they'll also see a highly specified rear wing that is a wrap around top element connecting to the lower element and this is effectively does away with the rear wing in plates 
uh, that created massive vortices. See, Grace, I told you I had vortices. So those end plates on the rear wing with all the sticky yuppie bits, as Grace mentioned, those created massive vortices that came off the back of that rear wing. This wing is wraps around and folds down to the underneath element and does away with those end plates, creating all those vortices. At least that's the thought um, behind that. And then along with that, the barge boards. Boy, have we seen some creative barge boards over the years, haven't we? How are we going to appetize our Bitburger from now I on? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Grace, how, how is Ferrari going to advertise Tic Tac? I don't know. I I did just want to say, please don't send me, you know, uh, at, n never send me anything nasty, but please just be nice. But uh, I did not invent that term. That's what Sam Collins calls them. So please do not tell me that I stole that from Sam Collins. I consume media just like the rest of you. I'm just saying he calls them sticky yuppie bits. I like that term. I use it as well. But that's where that came from. Way to go, Sam. Good that's for right. something, Sam, then. Sam knows a lot of stuff, that guy. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so barge boards i don't know i mean peak i like i like the idea of they've reached peak lunacy we're just done with them and yeah. well they um, did i think the evolution of the barge board has been quite a thing to see over the years with i want to say paul 2008 was arguably reaching peak lunacy uh, with all the, the bits and bobbles all over the car and the barge boards were insane. Mm -hmm. um, now, all of that is gone. The barge boards are all gone. I'm going to miss the barge boards if I'm honest. Yeah, I, I like the really clean ones, like yeah, the old Benetton too. one. It was just one yeah. plane and it, you got your Bitburger on it, as I said, or the yeah. Akai or whatever. And that was back when the cars right. were a lot cleaner. The front wings and rear wings were also a lot cleaner, but it just became, you know, yeah. Death Star-ish in the end. Right. right. You Too can much. get Warsteiner on one, you know. So anyway, no more barge boards. Uh, yeah. Now, the fun topic that Paul's been dying to get to <laughs> all night is we're going back to, was it 2009, Paul, when we had the wheel covers? Yeah. We're going to have wheel covers now back on the tires. Instead of being able just to see the cool spokes and the rim of a wheel, that it's just going to be a flat wheel cover that goes over the whole uh, wheel. Now, the reason they're doing that is to prevent the teams from using the wheel and axle to create downforce. So the air that was coming into the wheels, they were using that air to create downforce. If you put those wheel covers on, it blocks all that air from coming in and then being able to use that air uh, to create downforce. So now we're going to have these wheel covers. Maybe that's where they put the advertising. Right. Ooh, you could do it like when it, it actually makes something at speed. Yeah, you know? like a little, you know, like those things with the, like a flip with the book. paper when you flip yeah. it. You the know, you see book. the little stick person running yeah. across. Something yeah. Like that. yeah. Right. Or isn't it Bentley that the the hub they that stays upward? Like yes, it, it doesn't move. It? Yeah. It's a floating right. hub, yeah. Yeah. Well, a floating hub. Oh, yes. that would be good. You could put like Bitburger or you could put like, oh, I don't know, FedEx or UPS on it and make it where it balances so it doesn't turn while right. the wheels mm -hmm. are turning. And then that way you've got advertising. Perfect. Right. Or well, right, like the, all it takes. an yep. optical illusion. So it spins fast enough that now your eyes see words, right? right. That's what I was saying. Like at speed, top, right? or something. different at speeds, speed. different words. Right, right. You know? Yeah. Easy. Right. Fast. Yeah. So at different <laughs> speeds, it'd be like at slower speed, it says, uh, uh, if you drink, don't drive, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. Drink you know? more Oval Team. Right. <laughs> Drink more Oval Team. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, My little orphan Annie Dakota ring. Uh, right. Yes. Right. Yeah. She right out kid. But um, F I A. Uh, yeah. I mean, nowadays, there, there's no way you can go without some kind of pop up ad. Right. So, right. you know, I'm, I'm sure they've already thought about it. If not, we're going to be millionaires by the end of this podcast yeah. coming up with that idea we thought of it you yeah, heard it right. here first so also they're going to have a front wheel uh wing or a deflector above the front wheel and it's a small wing that's just above the front tire and it's intended to limit the outwash of airflow around the front wheel so 
as air hits the front of that car, the front tires are there, and that air deflection uh, creates an outwash. That wing is intended to uh, massage the air, if you will. Clean up the air. Clean it up. That's it, Paul. And uh, reduce it and have less outwash uh, coming out of that car. Um, the brake ducts. Uh, the brake duct uh, design has become very complex over the years, and they will now have a very prescriptive shape to limit downforce creation from the brake ducts. Uh, remember, that was a big talking point, was it last year, with the copycat uh, of Mercedes brake duct? Uh, right, right. The, the, mm -hmm. When Force India got it, right? But when yeah. it was Aston, they got right. they the same thing, right? Yeah. Right. Racing we force. We designed it all whatever. ourselves, said Otmar. Yes. We weren't even looking over that way. That's right. Apart just from when they sent the drawings under the hotel <laughs> the room door. The IKEA boxes just came pre-assembled. Yeah. <laughs> what was I supposed to do? Right. Um, right. Yeah. I was gonna I was gonna say go back to the wheel covers. This mm. would be the perfect opportunity to Ferrari to go back to the Marlboro barcodes, right? Like Oh yeah. Yeah. Or Mission Winnow, whatever the hell that yeah, was. Yeah, right. Or whatever no they are now. But just no go one back knows, to the... but it's provocative. All <laughs> <laughs> right. I have that, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I don't know if I can find it. Yeah, I can. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. Yes. There you go. Mission Winnow, very provocative. Mm -hmm. like It'll it. just be like that neon green spinning around on the wheels and blocks. And yes. We'll all be programmed to go buy Marlboro cigarettes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah. All right. So, well, what are the results going to be? Well, look, you know, there's most likely be different interpretations and different looking cars for sure. Uh, the template for the car is very tight, but it's not a spec car. Um, so that's that's all good. Uh, the hope is that a trailing car will retain 86 percent of its downforce while trailing another car within one car length as compared to what we've had, which is 55%. Uh, and that's what they've been struggling with today. So imagine, um, imagine my surprise when they said DRS is still going to be part of it. <laughs> Why? Ross not... promised us. Yeah. He said, we, this, these new rules are going to make DRS obsolete. So I brought right. in, I bought in. I bought in. I was like hook, I, line, and sinker. And it was like, seriously if, pissed off. If the car gets up behind another car and it only has about 55% of its downforce, I understand what DRS was accommodating for. But on the flip side of that, if it now retains 86% of it... You don't need it. Why do we need the guy, it? The guy behind should... That's enough margin for the person behind to earn their spot. Yes. Yeah, I agree. 14% down to the driver. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right. Safety. Also, uh, a couple of recent incidents uh, have been accounted for in the new design. The first was a uh, stronger sides to the car and a longer nose. And that was uh, to minimize the situation uh, that we saw with Antoine Hubert at Spa with the T-bone. Um, so mm. they've taken that into account to try to address some of that T-bone impact energy. Also, the Roman Grosjean incident uh, was studied, and the design has been made uh, with the new cars to prevent a fuel tank ruptures should the engine uh, be separated from the chassis uh, violently, like we saw with Roman Grosjean. So they've thought about these two elements and tried to bake those into uh, the yeah. special. It, it's amazing how this has progressed since you know its inception. I mean. They've done a really good job. Yeah. You know, they haven't been flipping about the safety of side impacts for as far as you know, decades now, right? right. Um, whereas I just put the tank around the driver and, hey, if you don't want right. to drive, don't drive. Don't show yeah, up. Yeah, right. Um, but they, they've made massive gains. And it's it's hard to believe that they keep making these gains, but it's, it's really impressive to see and, and it can't be encouraged enough. Yeah, and to be fair to the FIA and those gains, that those gains are knock-on effects all the way through all kinds of motorsport. Paul, your your IMSA series would enjoy some of those safety measures that uh, have come out um, from some of the Formula One technology, et cetera. Yeah. So, uh, for sure, absolutely. All right. Well, that means I hope that helps you. I hope that it helps explain some of the regulation changes, what to look for. Uh, will they all work, uh, you know, swimmingly? Maybe not. Uh, some will need to be tweaked. Some won't work at all. Some will be exploited all to hell by the teams because they're ingenious like that. Uh, so keep an eye on those particular elements. Those are the things that are changing. 
Let's see how it works. There's a lot of room in the margins for uh, success. A lot of rooms in the margin for a complete cock up. We'll see. Uh, but they'll have to adjust it and, uh, and move forward. So, all right, let's do some Albans cats. That's right. It's now, great. Now, I've, never favorite. Been, I've never been on this portion of the show. No, you haven't. So do we, never count, do we count cats? No. Is that what we, we count how many cats he has? No, I can we? He has a he lot. He has five. Does he? Five cats. Okay, oh, well. I mean, and it's his family collectively, right? It isn't just Alex Albon has five cats. That his family, they have a horse and a dog. Mm-hmm. There oh, you go. One horse, one dog. Yeah, Tinky's dog. the horse. Five cats. Wow. Do you I like... Really- are they got like camera and you like tune in every day, Grace? No, just, they're on Instagram. They're cute. Oh, that's why I've never yeah. seen. Oh, see? Yeah. Yeah. See? Okay. Is Alvin right. still live with his mom? Yeah, well, I guess. I mean, he goes to. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I. I live <laughs> Who's there for here. Christmas? That's all I know. <laughs> right. I guess that's what I'm saying. Is like, I live in my own house, but I sure do still visit my parents. So I. <laughs> Yes, sometimes he's in the picture at his mom's house, but I don't know that he lives at his mom's house. Right, right. What does it all mean, Basil? But his siblings do, right? One of his his sister and his brother still live there. Just trying to follow. Is this like reality show for watching Alex Albon? Can I live with his mom? I I like the cats. You better better sleep with one eye open, as far as I know. (laughs) Clutching my pillow. Steal your wallet. Exit night. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyway, Alvin's cats. Uh, so Grace, do you have anything for Alvin's cats before I get to Todd's no shit headlines? I don't because I I'm totally into this like no shit headlines thing. This okay. Because there right. are clearly many of these headlines that I think we've all read that I've gone. Huh. You know when yeah. they try to make it like you know this big thing and you're like right. yeah we knew that Ralph Schumacher was going to Toyota like six months ago why are you writing this like oh surprise surprise yeah, yeah. so Paul uh, you haven't been in this segment so here's what I do with my uh, Todd's No Shit headlines I go out and I find headlines that I think are funny because the art of headlines has just gone I, it's just over the top now. I, I don't, Clickbait I don't know. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. I, if, if there was an AP uh, style book, uh, it was never given to current day journalists. Uh, because... No, it just says there's only one bullet point. Get as many clicks as possible. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's like how Paul came in second at Dubai using this one strange trick. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that's strange trick. Yeah, well, it's a strange, strange trick. It's a strange trick. It's a strange trick. Come on, Paul. We can't well, I had that little trick. bowl and I was mixing stuff up. <laughs> I know what you did, Paul. Boy, uh, boy, watch boy, Paul. Uh, so anyway, so I go and find these headlines that are just, the headlines are out of control these days. And so I find them and it's kind of like you read me and go, yeah, no shit. You know, okay, whatever. Uh, so I got to tell it, your friend and mine, more your friend than mine, I just happen to know him via you, uh, Zach Brown. That's how I know everybody. Very, yeah, Paul. I know. I act like I go around acting like I know Zach Brown. I've interviewed him three or four times. And when I was at a feature, like an event, a cocktail party at one of the F1 races, he was, you know, he waved at me and was like, hey. We're friends now. Back in early. I just put that on my name tag. You know, Grace, friend of Paul. I just put Zach Brown's friend. Yeah, I'm really not Zach Brown's fan. I've interviewed him. He know I think he knows who I am, but he's a super good guy. I've interviewed him yeah. three or four times. Super good guy, but I don't know him. Paul is friends with Zach Brown, so uh, Paul knows Zach very well. Um, all right, so Zach in the news, McLaren. Here it is. Headline is top F1 teams quote holding sport to ransom over sprint damage allowance. <laughs> Do you get the impression Zach is not too keen about the whole sprint race increase for damage cost cap thing? Can you get the impression from Zach that spending one extra dollar on that damn team he is not interested in, that he loves the cost cap? I love it. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Saves his life, I think. (laughs) Yeah, it did. I feel like he found the, like... The, the secret desk drawer Rolodex of Ron Dennis isms, yeah. right? Like, oh, these are these are some great adjectives. Thanks, Ron, for leaving this behind for me. <laughs> nice, Ron. Exactly. Another Zach Brown headline. This is it. 
The headline reads, Abu Dhabi, quote, pantomime proves F1 and FIA needs reform. Wow, he's I mean, really taken on yeah, criticism, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Right? Pantomime. Punch and oh. Judy show at Abu Dhabi. Exactly, the Punch and Judy show. <laughs> the complete cock up at, yeah. at uh, yeah. So, boy, <laughs> I don't know. You know, Zach being American, look what the British have done to him. Right. Yeah. He's behind you. Yeah. What? Next day he's going to be walking around Burberry or something. Christian's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> so he's having a go at uh, F1 and the FIA says it needs to complete reform. It's a total pantomime over there. Punch and Judy show. Big uh, casino. That's my favorite saying from my friend, an Austrian friend of mine. Big casino. Oh, I don't a, know what that means. It's a good phrase. It means a big hubbub, a big hoopla, you know, oh. big load of nothing. Right. Okay. It's, it's a good, it's a good word. Michael good Massey phrase. is a... It's, it's less offensive than the word Grace was trying to get us to say on the show earlier. But. Was it? <laughs> I'm just trying to help out some friends. Hey, Grace's Round road rage family. verbiage is Oh, yes, offensive. that word. It is. Yeah. It's highly <laughs> offensive. I don't want to have to say those kind of potty mouth things, Grace. And yeah. um, I have no problem saying them, but I try to be respectful on the show. <laughs> you should see these before we start recording. For she's in here f bombing and yeah, just you yeah. know she's, it's Grace, man. Well, I'm just what? worried because sometimes she drives an electric car. They can I probably know. hear what you're saying now, Grace. <laughs> I think they can. Well, don't the Teslas now have? A speak like they can you can speak out to people which i think is a terrible idea like oh, that's why? A really bad idea. i was yeah. like that is that is no terrible. no michael this is a very bad deal very bad <laughs> yeah. idea no, when are you michael. gonna move the lap cars michael come on that's a bad idea grace can i just say so somebody you know there's a lot of crap out there in the world of the internet but sometimes people i find are very brilliant somebody took an old clip of knight rider and put Total Wolf as the car. Have you seen this as kids? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my God. So yeah. every time that Michael Knight talks to him, it's Total Wolf that comes back at him. It's great. No, no Michael. No, Michael. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Uh, people are very clever I that's, that's, that's good. good that's really yeah. good yeah. yeah well keeping it in the family paul this is an aston martin uh thing aston martin names crack as a new team <laughs> principal <laughs> so i also like that somebody took the simpsons right because they used to because bart simpson would always crank call moe's diner right or moe's yeah. diner, the bar moe's bar right and so somebody yeah. put mike crack Mike Crack, is there anybody here named Mike Crack? Mike I'm Crack, like, people, you're great. Uh, wasn't that in Porky's? That was yeah, a, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Porky's. That's that's, an Ooh, that's old school, there, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, Mike Crack, yeah. So anyway, the <laughs> Martin names Crack as a team. You know, what? I'm also surprised that Mike Crack is a very <laughs> slender guy. Like yeah. I would think, it's, I, I feel like. With a name that like name? that, you'd be beating people up all the time. Like, how did you survive grade school? <laughs> and unless he's like very, you know, like a, a, Engineering. a cyclist or something. I don't know. Right? Yeah, he was in <laughs> well, the AV he... club and he just hit out, which is what I did. Right. He was part days. of BMW's operation. You know, I don't know. I just, just think saying. Name like that you'd be good at beating people up. Paul used to work with BMW guys mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Worked so with everybody. I know yeah. you have. Yeah. Uh, so so you anyway, okay. With, uh, you friends with Chris Bangle too? Because I have a few words no, for him. No, oh. I had, I did meet Chris Bangle though when they they launched the uh, Seven Series, and you're like, what the hell is this? What the the hell? <laughs> the boot uh. isn't properly latched in. Can someone <laughs> tighten this up? There's a big gap in the. Oh, back. I'm sorry. Oh no, I designed it that way. <laughs> no, really? wait. Do you have the knife for the clay? I got to cut the back end off <laughs> a little bit. The good news Sorry. is design philosophy is going to work its way through all the brand. And oh, it did. It did. Yeah. And that's no, when I fell good. out of love with BMW. Oh, yes, so no. I like it when Grace brings up Bangle. Yeah. As I uh, said, I think on a podcast a couple weeks ago, I'd still blame him for everything. It's my favorite <laughs> hashtag. Somebody yeah. cut you off. Goddamn Chris Bangle. Yeah. Who Sorry, bangled this did... thing? Come yeah. on. <laughs> He's... He's become a verb. Yeah. I got it's bangled. Like a, it's like a Munson, you know? All right, like right. Bangle. Yeah. Right. All right, Zach Brown, back in the news. Zach says, 
teams must step back from governance. You think? <laughs> I won't, though. I'm getting they the won't. impression Zach Brown's had a butt full of this. He's, yeah. he's, he's mad. You can tell. The team's trying to lobby to increase the cost cap because of the sprint race damage. Uh, he's, he thinks the whole Abu Dhabi thing was a joke. Uh, now he's saying the teams need to get the hell out of the hole, influencing the governance of the sport, and get yeah. back to the way that Max and Bernie just, they'd make up the rules and tell you to go pound sand if you didn't like them. Mm-hmm. And that's think, the way yeah. Zach wants it. To I be think, honest with you, I think he's right. Straight from the hip, man. Straight from the hip. Yeah, I think he's right. Stop Go ahead, Grace. Politic. I think Zach Brown forgot that you're supposed to list out all these things, but only give them out every now and then. Like, I feel like he came up with <laughs> his top 10 complaints about the mm-hmm. FIA or Formula mm-hmm. One, and all of them came out his at once. His New Year's Eve was going bad, and he's like, okay, this is it. As right. opposed to, like, Christian Horner, who has that list, and he's like, Oh, this one, number eight. We're going to use that one today, right? right. Like, don't don't waste all your ammo when, you know, we're not even well, t- testing yet. Clearly, it's a it's the off season because if there's a person that they get access to, there's a million questions that go to him, and he just floods the headlines because he's the only dude that was talking right. that week, right? And so they should have, you know, at this point, I think he's mad, and and they they didn't ask him. Well, you know. Zach, what do you what do you think they should what what do you want to do in F one? Crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and they hear the lamentation of their women. There you go. There's Zach yeah. Brown. Yep. That's him. That's how he's going into the season. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's <laughs> mad as hell and he's not gonna take it anymore. That's right. Um here, this headline from Alpine. Alpine quote, Alpine parts way with non executive director and Alain Prost. Now, Grace, I Can put I this in there not handle? because it's not because it's a bad headline, but Grace, you and I just said, we just said that the entire paddock should be celebrating Alain Prost, not sacking him. No, he's a treasure, people. Why do we not that talk That guy's a national treasure, damn it, and he should be celebrated. They should have a national Alain Prost day in France. Yeah, he's being kicked around like a can on the street. Yeah. yeah. How many times does this boy get fired? It's... I don't know. Is he difficult to work with? <laughs> I don't know. Man. I'm just saying. Well, he is French. Well, <laughs> we. I'm just saying. I don't know. All right. They also sacked uh, Martin Budkowski. And many people believe that they're making way for the arrival of the myth, the legend that is Otmar. Just saying. He's coming. Yeah. All I'm gonna say time, is if that's personal. if that's <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> All I'm gonna say is uh, if that's true, Otmar's gonna have a hell of a lot of weight on his shoulder, and I have a lot of respect for Otmar and what he did at Force India and, and all of that, and and doing the performance that they did on the shoestring budget they had. Uh, I'll be very intrigued to see. I'm going to hold my tongue. How he fits in. I'm just going to bite my tongue. I'm not going to say it. I'm just going to hold my tongue. Let's just Uh, see how it turns out. I just think I can just see him coming in on day one. And who are you? And what do you do? And who are you? I'm Fernando Alonso. I'm the driver. Fine. You can stay. (laughs) I'm not sure I see it that way. Because remember when we saw uh, Otmar with... um... With Strong? With Larry? Oh, yeah. He's not that way with Larry at all. (laughs) Yeah. He was like... (laughs) There's a Whatever. lot of eye rolling. That was about it. Oh yeah, yeah. a lot of eye rolling. You could tell Otmar, he he Not had no like no no patience with Larry at all. And <laughs> Otmar wasn't about to sit there and have him adjust his junk right in his face. That yeah. wasn't gonna happen. Yeah. No. But I don't know. You know, you can imagine those phone calls with Otmar. Larry. So Otmar, you want to come over? Yeah, but some things need to change. Well, we know we need to get rid of Marson. You know, we yeah. need we need because then you're gonna be taking his role. Yeah, but get rid of that pro guy. Too. I was gonna say, you know that pro. I was really. <laughs> and they're like, well, Otmar, anything. he's a four-time world. Champion. Yeah, get rid of him. That guy's gotta go. <laughs> really? Okay. We can't keep him on just as a the titular head, as the face. No, out of here. Get rid of him. So now That's I think cold. this means everybody should find Alan Prost. He should become the new quote generator, right? Like the new he Jackie should. Stewart, right? He this should. is who we should be talking to. He's a free man now. He can say whatever yeah, that's he wants. Right. Or the new Nikki Lauda. He, he should be yeah. the new Nikki. That's right. Spill that tea. Yeah, that's amazing. And finally, 
This headline, which I thought was good, Pierre Gasly question asked by Damon Hill as Red Bull's Max Verstappen labeled freaky. <laughs> what? <laughs> was there that a is a real this? headline. I kid you not. That's a real headline. Let me read it again. Pierre Gasly question asked by Damon Hill as Red Bull's Max Verstappen labeled freaky. So was Damon Hill asking him if Max Verstappen is freaky? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this seriously. Click on that. Seriously. I know, right? If you're in your twenties, so if you're out there in your twenties, dude, this is not professional journalism. Okay, this is the for centuries we've been writing better headlines than this. Okay, the art of writing a headline or journalism has died in the hands of the current crop so this is why you should be going back and reading things from professional f1 journalists uh because they don't write silliness like this so anyway and what was what was pierre's answer oh i can't i, I i'm not gonna i'm not gonna tell and you what the article's about it, and then he found and then when he clicked on it, it was just like what are the kids from facts of life doing no you know, you know what a... <laughs> i clicked on it you know what the the, the context of the context is is damon hill was saying that you know, he was questioning whether Pierre Gasly was going to have a great career in F1 because of people like Max who have freakishly good talent. The, 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 what he can do in a car is freaky, what that kid can do in a car. Max he, and Lewis. He, of course, you know, if it's a Damon, he's going to be talking about Lewis. But in, you know, in this context, he's right. But what Max and Lewis, uh, what he, yeah, he was saying it was freakish how good he was. Um, so anyway, that's a context. So, Couldn't yeah. you have just worded that a little better? Yeah. So he you, basically you, asked dude, Pierre. You need to go home. You're drunk. Yeah, that's bad. So he basically asked him, like, are you okay with being a second tier driver? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm a second tier driver, sir. Right? Like. <laughs> yeah. That's that my was, teammate. Yeah. That yeah. was a drunk headline. That was just bad. Yeah. That was wow. bad. Anyway. Too many TikToks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's do some mailbag. You've got mail. All right, Miles asks this, Paul. Given the cost cap, do you think there is an advantage to constructor teams? Is there a way for them to develop parts but assign the cost to other race teams or their customer car divisions? Yes. Let me chime yes. in first. <laughs> um, this was always our concern, Miles. If you go back to um, the original cost cap discussions around this started back when max mosley was the fi president talking about cost caps and then uh, uh, jean talk came in and furthered that and eventually all those discussions about cost caps grace you and i talked about it at length uh, years ago uh three four years ago when cost caps was all the discussion we talked about this that if you were mercedes how would you know if you developed some kit in the road car division how would anyone know that right um and paul you and i talked about as a manufacturer we could bury a lot of this r d stuff into the road car divisions and we said how is the fia gonna police this how will they know mm -hmm. and i, I don't still know. don't know that i know <laughs> i don't know either i don't I mean, they're not gonna know and they're gonna get away with it you know and and max was challenged with saying that and he said well no we're gonna go in and audit the team's books and i said well, who the hell? It's a private company. Who the hell is going to want you digging through their P and L? Mm -hmm. If I'm, if I'm, or if you're going to be looking at the right ones, right? Yeah. Or if you're going to be looking at the right P and Ls, right? And a year later, yeah, right, right. So I just thought this whole thing was very untenable. I didn't yeah. know how it was going to work. I still don't understand how it's going to work. I think Miles, you bring up a good point. I think they've always said, yeah, but if we find somebody flouting it, the penalty will be severe. Uh, probably exclusion from that year's championship. Who knows? I don't know, but I, I I do believe you could bury some of this develop in in a different branch of the manufacturing. Who knows? Yep. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, for sure. It's good All to. right, Paul. It's been awesome having you on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's the off that. season. I know you. Uh, you know, <laughs> You're not, well, really like, uh, not my off season, unfortunately. No, it's well, not. Unfortunately, should I say. Yeah, you're a very busy man, Paul, and I yeah. appreciate you elbowing out. Rumor has it you might join us next week, too. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I committed to next week, too. We've right. we got a couple, 
couple of days in between the roar and the 24 i figured i can do it but after that god knows <laughs> yeah yeah right right yeah. gonna be yeah. a busy man so watch for the heart of racing aston martin team at imza at the daytona 24 two weeks time uh yes. you've got the qualifying race this weekend uh, the real race next weekend, the number 23, the number 27. If you're not cheering for them, do so, because that Please is do. the team that Paul is the sporting uh, uh, manager for. Yeah. Um, and, and I heard uh, there's going to be some swag available. I keep getting messages yes. from people asking, where is it? Where is it? So there's I know it's swag. in 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 the line. And and you'll be happy to know that we have a Belgian on the team this year. Nice. Yeah. Who is it? Maxime Martin. So he lives. Oh. Ah, keeping it up for so Belgium. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Maxine Martin. Already cool. sending pictures of uh, Austin Powers drinking his Belgian dip. <laughs> so... Nice. <laughs> it's a bit nutty. So, yeah, so this yeah. is all I know about Belgium, but it's yeah. very popular in Belgium, apparently. So I'll make sure I get lots of whipped cream for you. Speaking of swag, Grace, I'm loving the new Park for May logo shirt. Look at that. Grace, awesome. Having Thank showing you. the, you have to go to YouTube to watch this uh, for your listeners. But uh, Grace well, I couldn't pass this one up since it is the occasionally insightful. That on the is front. Grace, exactly. Grace's Monica, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that if I nice. ever have the opportunity to write my own autobiography, that will be the title of occasionally it. Occasionally insightful. <laughs> you think it's just here? I've right. you know, when I've met people out in the real world, they're like, "Wow, that's that's right. about right." Yeah, here that's, lies, that's all I got. Here lies Grace. Occasionally, occasionally insightful. insightful. It's good. I love that's it. All right. right. Be sure to stop by the website, theparkformay.com. Share your opinion. Just do it to Quorum of Civility. If you like this podcast, go over to iTunes. Give us some good love over there. Give us a good rating. Also, huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. We could not and would not do this podcast without you. And until next week, when we come back, the three of us, to do it all over again, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camera, saying so long. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.